Let's just uh, stand to the Lord. Stand this morning, morning, this evening. Sorry, it's all right. I fell asleep this afternoon, so <laughs> maybe not fully awake yet. Any requests before we turn to the Lord? All right. Let's all bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, as we come before Thee, Lord, we're ever so thankful, Lord, that You're mindful you, of every one of Your saints, Lord. Bless those that couldn't be here, Lord. Lord, we have come here to worship and praise thee tonight, Lord. You're worthy of praise and honor and glory. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that for thy little nation, Israel, that you look upon them. I know you have your eye upon them as well. And Lord, we're ever so thankful for what truth you have bestowed in our bosom in this hour. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated and ask Brother Paul to come lead us in the song service. Living below in this so sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation.
Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> if anybody has a song in their heart, I'll get yours after a minute. Where would I be without Jesus? Tell me where would I spend eternity? I'd be lost in a world full of sorrow without Somewhere else. Anybody know what number? Oh, it's right here. 218. Blessings are more numerous than the stars up above. I'm constantly aware of His love. I am constantly aware that He's everywhere and in my soul. the peace of the dove. I'm constantly aware of the It's number 218. Now when the storm clouds of life around me rages, I just cling to the mind To my soul, he whispers, sweet peace from heaven above. I'm constantly aware of his love. I am constantly. 
heavenly aware that he is everywhere and in my soul there is no fear for I know Like the peace of a dove, I'm constantly aware of His love. Now when the storm clouds of life around me rages, I just cling to the mind. Rock of ages, and to my soul he whispers, sweet peace from heaven above. I'm constantly aware of his love. I am constantly aware that he. I know he's always there, and in my heart there is contentment, like the peace of a dove, I'm constantly aware of his love. the number right underneath 219. Brenda, maybe you can help me sing that. Winds may blow Cares of life come against my soul Troubled times Swear to stand to be than in God's hands. Hands and in good hands, my soul is safe and secure. In God's hands, sweet assurance, it's good to know I'm in. It's good to know I'm in God's hands. Thank you, Lord. This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all of my heart, I worship.
give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all of my heart, I worship you. And that would you sing two, two, three? I can't sing it, but I love the song.
your day's labor and we will take we'll take our heavenly Try 240. <clears throat> Not sure what key of G or don't wanna do one thing on my own. Put me where you want me, Lord. me 
stay in the center of thy will. So when I'm in the lowest valley, I can climb the highest hill. Sister Monique, do you have a song tonight? Or? Brenda, do you have one afterwards? <laughs> Thank you. I testified about a tree in my neighbor's yard and worrying about another one on my other neighbors. But anyways, one uh, on Sunday afternoon started leaning on my beloved clothesline, and <laughs> it's been there ever, ever since. And uh, I'm just waiting for the arborist to come. And anyways, I'm just thankful that the Lord takes care of the little things. <coughs>
wants to share burdens to bear. He'll whisper peace when your world is bright. If it's your greatest joy, your deepest pain, or if
and praise the Lord tonight. I was sitting there, I was thinking about the condition that the world is in tonight. It's, it's groaning and crying and wanting relief too. And we groan within ourselves, waiting to wait the redemption of this body. But soon, we hope it's soon, God is going to change the picture altogether. And when Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom, it's going to be different. It's going to be altogether different. And that's what the world is groaning about tonight there. Waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. We're going to play a part in that kingdom. And uh, it's going to be different. I'm waiting for that. And longing for that day. <coughs> Key of G, I believe. <coughs> I know that I failed you, Lord, time and again, and each time you've always been true. So that's why I kneel at the cross once again and ask to draw closer. 
You want to change your positions? Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for thy gentle spirit that was here this evening. Lord, that's able, Lord, to remove all burdens and trials and weight that's sometimes upon us, Lord. We thank you for the time of refreshing. Now, Lord, as we would look into your word, I just pray use this vessel as you see fit. For I ask it now in that precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Be seated this evening. I'm thankful that from time to time God refreshes us with his spirit and also with his word has a refreshing us Gentile are a hungry bunch and I just want to say something that I want to correct this morning I mentioned that there would be no babies born in the millennium. There's no babies born in the eternal age. And I thank you, brother, for bringing that up. It's sometimes you have so many scriptures in your mind, and it's your mind's over here and your mouth is over there. I don't know if that ever happens to you, but if you're publicly speaking sometimes, that those things do happen. But I believe you saw the message as far as understanding what's taking place. And... Um, one thing for sure, if we're going to look at tonight, what is the wedding supper for? We know that, uh, I don't know if it's here. Now this will do. During that half hour silence, we know that in Second Timothy chapter four, verse one, that how he's going to judge the quick and dead, how that beautiful that dropped in into the Word of God, knowing where to fit it, not just it's just not out there somewheres, and Brothers and sisters, you and I are the quick. Unless we go by the way of the grave, when that half hour silence starts, you and I are going to be the quick. And it'll be, and like says, don't, I don't want to minister in such a place that, oh, we're going to come before the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to be all nervous and trembling. Relax. If you're there before his judgment seat, you have eternal life. Each and every one will have eternal life. 
but we're going to be told what our reward is going to be. Well, that's the extent of knowing the reward that whatever measure that we've been faithful to, God will, the Lord will indicate, well, you'll be ruler over one city, ten cities, or whatever the case may be. And that's, that's really wonderful. But after what I was looking at this morning, it's going to take the wedding supper to know the exact spot where you and I are going to rule in that millennium. We will know at the wedding supper what our work is going to be. And what, from what we learned this morning, you're part of a heavenly government. And everyone, not I'm going to just use the natural, natural things that we can see here on earth. When someone gets elected to the government and they go up to be formed that part of the government, Sometimes that person get, that got elected doesn't know all the ins and outs how the government functions. Now, if they've been in the government a long time before, they have a real good idea how that works. So the wedding supper is going to be predominantly knowing where are you going to rule? And we aren't going to pick, well, Lord, I like Florida or California. More likely, the Lord will put us in a place from the nations and where we come from. We will not be Gentiles, will not be ruling over the, the Jewish people, so don't get that idea. And traveling, that sort of answered the question this morning. When we come with the Lord Jesus Christ, and every eye shall see him, he stands in the spirit world. And as that globe turns around, every eye gets to see him, but he's not affected by gravity. But it don't take him long to move out of that spirit world and to descend in Jerusalem. When he does descend towards Jerusalem, and he puts his foot on the Mount of Olives, you and I are not going to Jerusalem. But Brother Fred, I, 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 I want to go. You'll be able to go there quite easily. But remember, he's setting up his government, which we just have been informed and told what we're going to do, how to do it at the wedding supper. Does that make sense to you? Because just knowing that you're you're going to rule over so many cities. Us Gentiles, the first thing I where, why, what for? We're like little kids sometimes like that. And so therefore, in 24 hours, as the earth turns around, I'll stop that because it squeaks and probably in on, on the internet. You and I could drop to our throne positions in 24 hours or less, because the earth turns around. How many, now, you can look this up on Google. The earth's diameter, uh, diameter, the circumference is 24,000 miles. 24 hours, that's 1,000 miles an hour. No, you don't have to travel at that speed, but if we're unaffected by gravity as being in the air now, within 24 hours, you can be, play, be in to the spot that God has ordained and told us what we're going to be at that wedding supper. As we look at the throne where Jesus is going to be sitting at, the more... I start looking into Matthew 25 and verse 31 to 32. That when he sits on his throne, he's going to divide the sheep from the goats. 
And if I just put my mind in just looking at it in the real words that it said there, I do not get the picture. The whole aspect of Matthew 25, sometimes we lose sight, it's a parable. And I know I might be repeating some things I did this morning, but it's, a, it's good for you to hear it again sometimes. We can't just take those words and use our human intelligence to say, well, Jesus is going to have all the crowd there and he's going to separate one from the other. No more than in that same parable that the foolish says, give, some, give us of your oil. That's to portray a spiritual condition that's on the earth. All that Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 32, if you look at it as portraying, he's setting up his government. Now, when you start to look at it in realistic terms, because this here has to be plausible on the earth. The mortal people that will have come through the great tribulation of the day of the Lord, they're not some sort of mystical people that can just float everywhere. They're going to be whatever's left. And how much is left? It says a few. That's in Isaiah 24 and other scriptures of, of on that line. Um, Isaiah chapter 13. It talks about few people left. And what is a few? When we look at the population today, 7.5 billion. Well, 7.5 billion, we're not in the week, we're, the, we're not, slow down. We're not in the week yet. It could be 8 billion by the time the week of Daniel arrives. And I'm not here to say, well, I know what the few means. Few means a very small number. There was a few that went that seen Jesus rose up into heaven into glory when taken up into the cloud. There was five hundred compared to what maybe there might have been around two and a half to three million people at the time in Jerusalem. A few people seen them there go up. Now, if we take seven point five billion people and you give ten percent. Let's just say, let's say, I'm just saying, just speaking out loud, if it was 10% of the population of 7.5 billion, you would have 750 million survivors that would be going into the millennium. That's quite a few. That's more than Canada. We're only 30 million or 35, whatever it is now. But if you drop it down to 1%, that's still 70 million. Now, the reason I bring us have to use numbers is to get our mind looking at what do you look at as being few? Because remember, if we take Matthew 25 as being literal as it's spoken right there, Jesus sits on his throne and he divides the sheep from the goat, and we're just using the literal word as our natural mind looks at this, we won't catch the picture. It's the only place in the scripture that's written where he actually, where it says he's going to separate the sheep from the goat. You'll not find any other to, col to collaborate that particular verse. But we know there's going to be few people. He's going to separate some people going into the millennium. But here's what I want you to look at. We've all seen pictures of the temple haven't we now that room that's in there is I believe it's 20 feet deep 20 feet wide and 20 feet high this room here is probably bigger than the temple room now if Jesus is sitting on his chair and if we're looking from a literal standpoint he's going to divide the sheep from the goats you ain't going to get a thousand people in there, let alone millions, right? So therefore, that is putting pressure on how he's going to divide the sheep from the goat. If you're looking at it, if he's going to do it literally himself. 
But let's say he comes to the door of the temple and the, this inner court here. If you could squeeze 10,000 people in there, that would be probably the max. That's only 10,000 people. But how do you deal with whether 750 million or 70 million? How do you get that crowd in there to be divided? You don't. So thinking in the terms that Jesus is going to actually separate them physically to be there in his, in his front of his eyes, it's not plausible. But if you look at it as a term of a government, because he told one day to his disciple in Matthew 19, verse 28, in the regeneration, you will sit on thrones judging the tribe of Israel. And when, now we look at that, oh yeah, that's after he divided the sheep from the goats. No, it is not. It is, they sit on their throne. We sit on our throne at the same time Jesus sits on his throne. Remember, he's setting up his government. He's not going to wait around, well, uh, those, Ameri those Canadians there, they're so slow, I have to wait maybe six months before they ever get there. I know I'm ab living. But we're going to sit on our throne, like I said, within 24 hours, as he drops down to Jerusalem. We are, wherever our place is designated, designated at the wedding supper, we will drop down to our respective place. So therefore, that him de de separating the sheep from the goats, remember, it's a parable. And the implication or the spiritual application is down in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 10 and 11 and so forth. It talks about he that's coming is given a kingdom and a domain, a rulership. Now, even in those days, whether you want to look at a king in the days of Daniel, the king didn't bring everybody before him and he doing the judgment on everything taking place. He had ministers that was in place, doing the judgment, repre representing him. Because that now makes more po possible or feasible how this is going to be judged. Now he talks about the 12 disciples, or the 12 apostles, they're going to judge the 12 tribe of Israel. They're not the only ones. They're our bride that are Jews that came out of the first church age. If they're bride, they're going to be sitting on thrones too. Why is there that many? And how, what kind of numbers do you think the bride is at when we come with the Lord Jesus Christ? A few thousand? And maybe in the order of seven to ten million. God knows the numbers that needs to be with the bride to have the right amount of people that's going to be sitting on the earth. So when the millennium starts, he will judge them. And you and I are the, his representative judging the sheep from the goats from whence we were from. But how's, how's it been representative? Yes, in the natural Ottawa doesn't call every minister saying, now I want you to say this and I want you to say that. But remember, we're the bride. We have the Holy Spirit. We all have one Father. And the Father is in His Son. And speaking in the Spirit, it is like having, I wouldn't want to put it like a text. You can text everybody. But in a moment's time, you get all the information that whatever is required when we are in place sitting on our thrones. And I know sometimes in our mind we go thinking, well, how am I going to, I don't know anything about judging. Huh? Are you ready to judge a sheep and a goat? No. But I'd have to say on the other side of things, because we lived in this natural world, we came across things that are right and wrong. 
that doesn't give you and tell you everything that you need to know because when we go into the rapture, we have a resurrected body and we have a full measure, then we will see clearly, we'll see like he sees, and the spirit that shows him can show us what you need to do. So it's going to be very simple. The spirit says, these over here, those over there. It can't be any simpler. There won't be no internet connections. It'll be through the spirit of God doing this role that Jesus is ruling in his kingdom. So as we sit on our chair, where we may be, we are representing him as if he be there. The natural governments, whether in the Old Testament or the New, it's the same way. The highest court of our land. You don't go before Prime Minister Trudeau. Now, I don't know, I don't think he'd be able to judge right according to what God wants. But nevertheless, the judges that are there, whether it's a court in the different provinces, they represent him, although he doesn't have to be there. He is in charge of it. And so is it with the Lord Jesus Christ when he sits in his temple. Now, when I see that parable of Matthew 25, when he comes and he sits in his temple, he also has each and every one of us sitting in our place judging the, the sheep and the goats around the world. There's another scripture, and I know I've repeated some of this. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, it says, And to him that overcome will I grant him to sit in my throne. I'd like to talk to that person that says, yeah, that's what's going to happen. How do you fit 10 million people in that spot right here? It's figurative. Sitting on the throne of authority to rule, not meaning in Jerusalem, in the temple himself, being there. I believe God wants this here understanding to be opened up a little bit more. It's not my revelation. God has showed Brother Branham a whole lot of things concerning the judgment. He expanded more with Brother Jackson. And cannot God expound a little bit more understanding of the same revelation in this hour? Well, it says he's going to actually divide the sheep from the goat. And I have to ask that person, then do you expect to walk on streets of gold in heaven too? See where that goes? But this in Matthew 25, remember it's a parable showing the conditions how God sees things transpiring in the earth. Now, I know it's a review, but uh, uh, when Ray said, well, I can't be there tonight, so it's sort of a, a last minute, so. But uh, just to get the point across, after the day of the Lord is finished, the sinners has been destroyed, not all humanity. We sometimes see, oh yeah, he's going to destroy maybe a few buildings over here. There's going to be an earthquake. There's going to be some volcanoes. Well, I'd like to show you. Here's a tsunami. 2004. In the Indian Ocean. It affected 11 countries. 280,000 people were slaughtered. As that wave hits the shore. Now, what is a tsunami? It's triggered by an earthquake. The earth moves. It pushes a body of water. And there's such enough force that it pushes it. You don't see it speeding, but the pressure of the water moves so fast, it can move at the speed of an airliner. What happens, that big body of water is being pushed hard. And then when it gets up on the shelf where, they, where he's coming up off the shore, then that now, now he's got nowhere to go. It rolls itself up into a wave and wipes out people. 
But 280, as great as that tsunami was, it's 280,000 people that lost their lives, and that's sad. But in those 11 countries that were there, you're looking over 50 or 70 million people in that area. So 280,000 is a very small number, isn't it, compared to the nations with there. Now, if it be the day of the Lord, these tsunamis, these earthquakes, are going to have to be of a much greater magnitude to get rid of a lot of flesh quickly. I'll just... That was Mount St. Helen. It blew its top. And that would be small compared to what's going to transpire. And around the area, within, I don't know, 50, 100 miles, or I don't know how far it was, the ash cloud was so thick that it killed some people. They didn't survive. Now, the Bible tells me we're going to walk on the ashes of the sinners. It's not going to be a little Mount Helen volcano. It's going to be something so tremendous, it'll cover a lot of people. So this God's way of burying the sinners, if you want to. <coughs> Tsunamis, earthquakes... And I, I can't put it strong enough in Revelation chapter 16, around verse 19, or somewhere in that vicinity in that chapter, that the cities of the different nations fell, not one, not two, of the different nations. And as the cities fell, that the infrastructure's gone. How can somebody from... South Africa reach Israel in time. There's no roads. You may find a car. You may find a, a van. But only to go down the road a little bit, and the road's cut off. The bridges are gone. Because remember, we're talking about a magnitude much greater than what man has ever seen. Like I mentioned this morning, the greatest disaster that took place was the China flood of 1931. It killed one million people. Out of then, there must have been three quarters of a uh, million people at that, at that hour. Well, that still leaves a lot of flesh, doesn't it? And, it, and China is over one billion people on themselves now. Look at India. You see, the, see where the picture's going? So that's why we need to come and he has his, you and I in thrones in different places to judge the sheep from the goat that it don't take some 10 or 100 years to get these people in place so they can be judged. So therefore, looking at Matthew chapter 24, 25, when he separates the sheep from the goat, it's because you and I are representative wherever these may have come through that had survived at the time. All right. Yeah, there won't be no cell phones working then. These people that text, it'll be over. <laughs> cell towers will be gone. Power grid will be gone. You won't be able to cook your supper on an electrical stove. Does that mean everything's gone? No, there may be some equipment still left. And out of all those sheep that will survive the day of the Lord, they're not all dummies. Some of them will have trades, whatnot, that God will have. And, it, and they are sheep that will help reestablish the millennium. They won't start from scratch. Well, we've got to rub two sticks and learn how to make fire. But there'll be things already there. Not a whole lot, but it'll be starting a new beginning. That's the ring of fire, where mo the majority of the population is at, and in no time flat, God just speaks the word, the word, earth, reel to and fro, go down at the noonday, the sun. The plates are so active that it'll make that 
earthquake in Japan looked like peanuts. That they had that tsunami, that, that earthquake that took place in the ocean where they almost lost that nuclear reactor. Well, Brother Fred, what about those nuclear reactors now? You mentioned that. God knows how to bury it. The earth may open a big place and sink that thing deep, close it up again. All right. So once we have found our place, that's why when now I look at Matthew chapter 25, it's not talking about the literal Jesus stepping every sheep that comes before his physical eyes, but it is his government, and it's a parable. All right, maybe I've said enough for that for now, so we're going to go on a little further. So once we come in to the millennium and we're at our places of abode where our thrones are at, the scripture declares that as, we, as the millennium would start, And it's found in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16, if we want to turn there for a moment. And in Zechariah, the 14th chapter, And it shall come to pass that everyone that's left of all, and there's a small word, nations. So those that are, has, it'll come to pass that all those that's left of the nation that came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king of, and the king of, the Lord of hosts, and keep the feast of their tabernacle. So when the millennium starts, that remnant has gone through the day of the Lord. Now to identify that word few, the Bible talks about them as being a nation going in there. Now a nation is not two people or half a dozen or a thousand people is not a nation. I know there's some small nations in the world, but there are more than a thousand that, that forms that nation. How many know that in the world, there's 195 nations as a whole. There is 196. There is a small one that my son told me, well, Fred, Dad, uh, there's a, there is actually another one, a small, a very small one. Well, that's fine. Whether it's 195 or 196, doesn't really matter. It's talking about generally, out of the nations, whatever the nations are, there's going to be enough people to form what's called a nation, nationhood. All right? And they're to come up once a year to worship the Lord. Now, it's the whole nation. Let's take Canada, for instance. When Canada was being founded, when our forefathers decided to make Canada a nation, there was probably in the order of a million or two, or whatever the number is, I'm not sure, of people that was there that went to Charlottetown, not far from here, where they founded the nation of Canada. And so therefore nations 
It's not a million people or two million people that's going to go to Jerusalem once a year before the Lord. Now there it says they go once a year before him. And I'll use the word Brother Jackson put it this way. No, it ain't going to be that million or two million people traveling over there. First of all, the infrastructure in the beginning won't be there to do it. Number two, it'll be the representative of that nation, like they have representative of nations that comes together. They're the one going up before the Lord. And the reason they have to come up before the Lord to worship him, and if they've done fine, they will get their reign and things will go on good for them. If not, he will withhold the reign and that nation will be punished. That's what, if you want to put in all the scriptures looking at at that particular aspect. Now, verse 17 throws a whole different light, another light on this picture. And it shall be that whosoever shall not come of all the families. Now, why didn't they say nation? Because when the sheep and the goats was divided, We thought Armageddon killed a lot of people. How many millions in Revelation chapter 16 or around there? Quite a few. 200 million men lost in the battle. The day of the Lord slays billions. And now there's enough yet to be nations that is going to be coming through. But once we're finishing separating the sheep from the goats, the number is reduced again. That it, they won't be in the numbers to be a nation, they'll be families. Are we getting the picture? Well, well, how small? Remember, there's no death if you live right in the millennium. The population will explode because there's nothing to kill them unless they disobey and, and the rod of iron is used and death is in, imparted to them. And so therefore, and it shall be that whosoever not come, uh, that will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem, the kings of kings, even upon them shall be no rain. Now God could have destroyed them right off the bat, but the God is merciful even in the millennium, although he rules with a rod of iron. But if after a while they keep being disobedient, the ground is going to be pretty parched and they're going to have a hard time to eat. Right? Plus the rod of correction can be used at the same time. Now when we talk about the rod of correction, is Jesus going to say, now wait a minute, Peter, Paul, I know you're here. I got to go to uh, uh, Brazil and, and execute the rod of iron because there's a few that are not behaving in the way they should, and so therefore their life is going to be terminated. Now I'm speaking generally as, as looking at this picture. No, he don't leave there. He sends the message, or whoever's on the throne of the Gentile bride that's there is the one that's going to have to speak it. Now, who's going to be doing the doing away with that sinner that doesn't want to comply in the millennium rule? It's the great eternal Father. The great eternal Spirit is going to be taking that life. In the descent of Jesus to the earth, is he personally killing billions of people? No, he speaks the word. The earth reels to and fro, the plates move. A lot of mankind loses their lives right there, and few men left. And if you're squirmish, I got good news for you. You will not be killing any of the sinners off of the face of the earth yourself. It says in Psalms, I believe, 91, verse 8, Only by thy eye will you see it. We are there as a witness. Oh, here's a good scripture. I, I didn't bring this this morning. Let's go to Psalms. 
Psalms 149. In Psalms 149, this is speaking about the time frame of the day of the Lord. Things that are pertaining to us, if you want to, in that sense. Verse 5, let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Or beds means where you're staying. Not that you feel sleepy and, and, and you know, I need, I need my afternoon nap. It's bed means the place where you reside. God, I hope your bed is the place where you live. Unless you're a wanderer that, that sleeps on the street and different things. Anyway, don't go there. All right. It says in verse 6, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hands. Who has a two-edged sword in Revelation chapter 19? Jesus has it. But here it's talking about their mouth. It's speaking about the bride. To execute judgment upon the heathen and punishment upon the people. No, you won't be using a physical sword to kill them. In the same manner that Jesus didn't use a two-edged sword to kill the sinners off of the face of the earth. But it is used showing the authority. The sword is the authority of God's word. To bind their kings with chain and their noblemen with feathers of iron. To execute upon them judgment written. Now why do we have to be there? Because the saints have suffered much during the grace age. You've been called this and that. Some have been, been uh, tore apart asunder, burnt, and so forth. Of course, we don't have that in this hour. But there are some being persecuted for one reason or other. But because of what the sinner has done to the different saints down through time, they, to execute upon them, not the Let's say if you lived a thousand years ago, you're not going to execute it there. You're going to execute those that are living when this transpires. To execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. But I don't want to. You're still in an emotional character. Remember, when we get our resurrected body and we have the full measure, we will see like he sees. And as Jesus is a loving, caring son of God, does he want to see billions being executed in the day of the Lord? But because God, as it put in his spirit, to accomplish this, so will it be in you and I to accomplish whatever the Lord wants done in that time. Well, does this change the revelation that God showed Brother Branham or Brother Jackson? It's just more light opening it up to it. And to finish it for tonight, I don't want to keep you too long. When we talk about the millennium, when does it start? It's in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Now we see an angel. Come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And this is none other but to do this. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, 
that is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. He don't bind him in the day of the Lord as he's closing out. He binds him at the same time that Jesus is now sit, coming down and putting and sitting in his throne. Because if that Satan is bound for a thousand years and Jesus has to reign a thousand years, they both have to coincide with the same time. All right? Now down in verse... Four, it says, and I saw thrones. That's you and I. Not all in Jerusalem now, but in the different places of the world. And they sat and was given to them judgment, given to them judgment, and was given unto them. Now the judgment that's given to you and I is what Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe around verse 2. That the saints is going to judge the world. We look at that, oh yeah, that's when the millennium has already started, it's on its way. No, it's right from day one. Because if you and I are going to rule and reign a thousand years, it's from day one. Right? So what happens on day one when Jesus sits and sets up his kingdom? You and I are sitting on our thrones. We don't start a year or two years later or whatever case may be after we all sat around in the temple where Jerusalem on his seat. You know how, where that goes. That's impossible. That's just wishful thinking or carnal understanding. But from day one, if we are going to be the people And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, judgment was given them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the word of, of Jesus and for the word of God. That's showing it's after the week of Daniel, because that's where these people lost their lives. It's not during the middle age of the grace age and so forth. It's at, in that week of Daniel. So it's showing you time-wise where these people have come from which had not worshipped the beast nor his image. So the image and the beast is in the week of Daniel, isn't it? And the mark of the beast is only enforced in the middle of the week, not in the beginning. And neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. We've been taught that first resurrection. We are part two of that first resurrection. And if we're going to reign a thousand years, that means that starts from day one. It starts day one when that angel comes down and binds Satan. And Satan is not thrown in a lake of fire in the day of the Lord. It is that spirit of the beast and that Antichrist is thrown in the lake of fire. But Satan is bound for a thousand years to test the millennial subject at the end. I hope I'm not going too fast with this. But you have, God has instilled, instructed a lot of knowledge in your bosom. So I'm not speaking to novice tonight. And so therefore, blessed, verse 6, blessed and holy, he that has part of the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests, of God and Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Yes, the white robe is going to be part as far as priests in the, in the millennium. But you and I are going to reign on thrones because that's what the scripture declares out throughout the New Testament. We're going to reign on thrones. It starts from day one. And as I was coming up this morning, And it talks about in Daniel chapter 12, 
No, I don't, you don't have to turn to Israel. It's Daniel chapter 12, verse 12. It talks about, blessed is he that comes to the 1,335 days. Now that's measured from the middle of the week. It says when the, when the Antichrist sits, takes away, the sacrifice is taken away, you're on the middle of the week. So counting from there up to 335 days, that man is blessed. Well, the, what does that coincide with? The day of the Lord is over. The millennium is started. He's blessed because he's in on day one of the millennium. And because, well, Brother Fred, it says, do the sheep enter into the millennium as if it's going to be starting after the judgment taking place? My foot. That's just a human understanding. That's tradition from the denominational church. 335 days. We reign a thousand years. Satan is bound a thousand years. Everything coincide with that thousand years. How much clearer can it be? And then when we look at Matthew 25, now that we have a better understanding, it's a parable. We have to look at what the Spirit of the Lord is saying as he was saying those words when the, he comes and sits on his throne, he's going to separate the sheep from the goat. That don't mean he's going to do that physically. No more than you and I are going to give oil through the fool, trying to give oil through the foolish version. No more than the streets of gold we're going to walk on. But it's verse 31 and 32 portrays the setting up of Jesus' government. Because I was kind of worried years back. Uh, we're all going to sit on this throne. How is that going to work out? I know I'm have to live in there again, but just to get the point across. Are you happy? Does this open up our spiritual understanding of a true picture? It's no different than what we've been looking at concerning the judgment seat of Christ. And I heard rumbles of, well, we don't really need to know that. We know that there's a, the day we all have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. They don't know where and when, for sure. But how beautiful that picture is laid in here. And the key to it is Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, Luke chapter 19, verse 15, where the angel comes down, having received the kingdom, when he's here on earth, that's when he starts judging those servants, not in glory, they're on the earth, because that's where that angel is there. And if he can represent Christ as for you and I at the judgment seat of the living, the quick, and that told me, we're going to sit on thrones wherever we are. We're not going to be in Jerusalem doing it, right? Concerning the millennium part of it, thing. And so the judging of the quick, that's down here. Oh, my. You're going to know more than your name is on, on the scroll. Now, the angel is not going to come with a physical scroll. It's going to be yay long and... And you know how they do, like at university, who graduated, and they go and look on the list if your name's there. You'll know by the Spirit of God that you're there in that half hour that you are part of that bride. And when we come before him to be judged, well, do we have to travel somewhere to where that angel is? No. That angelic being has one foot of the land, one foot on the sea, it's universal. This, this angel will travel to wherever a bride is during that half hour silence. Now there's other thing we could bring in about the half hour silence with showing the time frame we're living in. And I've heard things about a week or so ago 
how that spirit of Antichrist is still trying to rise up that revelation that in 2004, the miraculous has started. My foot. Well, nobody's ever contested it. It was in 2009, in 2010, and when and other thing that God has brought, but you don't want to look at that. You want somebody to bring it to you so you can have an argument. I said, that's the spirit of Antichrist. Well, you're talking about some brothers. Listen. Tares are still among the bride. It's, the bride has not come to completion yet. The bride's not going in to that half hour silence before the Lord with multiple different type of revelations. First of all, the true bride will have been watching and waiting. God yet brought the bride from the days of Brother Brandon to Brother Jackson. But in this hour, he's also brought her up to a bit more. Maybe not the deep things that was brought in those days, but there's still nuggets today. Well, okay, I thought I was going to be a little shorter there. It is already an hour. But I'm thankful. To me, it's not my revelation. It's not that I start dreaming these things up. God has to use somebody to say something to feed this bride after 2004. And feeding a bride is not just the fundamental doctrines of salvation, which is what we need, and it's needful, and there needs to be part of the ministry to minister that. But if there's never a recognition of what God's doing in this hour, then it makes me worry. What spirit do they have? Does not the same Holy Ghost that reveals is the same Holy Ghost that opens it up to the believer as well? All right, I better stop because I'm going down the wrong road. Why am I speaking in that, that way? So I can help them to wake up, at least look at it. If you got something better, please bring it out. I won't be offended. And if I'm wrong, I'll tell you I'm wrong. And like the brother pointed out to me before the service, he said, Brother Fred, uh, you mentioned there's no babies born in the millennium. And he's right. But as I was speaking, I was, my mind was over here and the mouse is over there and it's not in line. But that was not my whole message. I hope we're revelated enough to see the whole message where it fits. Oh, praise God. Yeah, okay, enough. We'll put the world away for now. We got to give the glory to Jesus. He's the head of the church. And the head of Jesus is the great eternal spirit. And it's the Father that's doing the building. Because how's he doing the building? He's in every one of us. And sometimes you hear, well, well, it's Christ doing it. It's Jesus doing it. Yes, Jesus is the, same, is the identification spirit of Almighty God. But he dwells in you and I by faith, not in actuality. Because if that is, when we get over there, Father, make them one like we are one. And Jesus hears everything. Guess what? When we go up in the rapture, as those foolish virgins on the earth and those Jews are praying, every one of us will hear everything because we'll be like him. Jesus is the type of the Old Testament priest. He represents the nation. Jesus is there to represent the bride. 
and whatever is needful, the Father brings it to him to direct the bride. Who does the miracle? Who, who, who anoints us to do things? It's the eternal spirit. There's no other God besides me. But it's through Jesus that he puts the direction in. That's true. Well, praise God. Well, that's another subject for another day. How that revelation was pretty heated in the, in the late 70s and the beginning of the 80s. You there are my age, and I don't want to tell the women their age, because that's a no-no. Right, brother? Okay, I understand. Those, we all came through those things. But once God had opened it up, it didn't take five, ten years to looking at it to find out if this is true. That same spirit that was using our brother, Brother Jackson, is the same spirit that can reveal it to you as it is being brought forth. Not ten years later. Well, I feel good. Because this afternoon I was so tired I fell asleep. And May says, I fell asleep too. I said, well, good thing that we woke up at the right time. Because you'd been without a preacher here tonight. But there's time God wants you to speak from the heart. And I just have to say thank you, Lord. We all say we're not worthy, and truly we are not worthy. But be, even though we're not worthy... He can still use you and I for whatever purpose he has designed us to be. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Yes, we look in the worthy and the things that we want to be like Jesus. But he saw a quality in you that can hear his word and be molded. Putting on the Lord Jesus Christ is not the fleshly side of things because if we are to be made in the image of Christ, what is that image? That's what's done through the Spirit of God for you and I in our growth. Part of his revelation, part of his trials and tests in our growing to have that nature of Jesus Christ which he portrayed, which is the spirit and nature of God. And now I'm getting another subject and you're getting worse than in my old age. Let's just stand. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, once again that Lord, in simple understanding, Lord, except, Lord, you open up our eyes, Lord, we can do nothing in ourselves. But I just pray, Lord, that you paint the picture that you want, Lord, in the hour that we live in. I thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters. In Christ Jesus' name I pray tonight. Amen and amen. amen. Now, uh, is, it, is it off there, Paul?